Hey everybody, welcome back. It's the Binding of Isaac. Had a great run last time, learned something. I don't, I don't know why I, that's a lie, probably. Uh, Kane again. I, the, one of the only characters. I think you, you roll it twice in a row, people are not going to be like, please re-roll. I think instead people are like, Kane, I like that guy. He's, he's some people's favorite. And disliked by very few. By very few. You know how hard that is to be in today's divided world? Normally there's, you know, the the average uh, public figure, of which I would describe uh, Cain as one. Um, I mean, he was not that well liked biblically, I suppose. But he wasn't, I don't know, the, look, let's not go down this road necessarily. Most of my knowledge of, uh, of the biblical times or uh, biblical stories is from the movie Year One, starring Michael Sarah and, and Jack Black. I would hazard a guess that that's probably not considered uh, a canonical source, but on the other hand, it applies five random pill effects. And I'm Kane. The pills must be good. The spice must flow. Hold on. Hold on. Don't get into trouble here. High Priestess. We don't know what the other one is yet. How about now? The lovers. Um, hear me out here. If this kills me, then so be it. Good. It, it shouldn't be able to. The pills should all be good. A horse pill experimental treatment? What the heck? Experimental pill tears up? That was insane. That's like the, the best use of that card I've ever seen in my entire life. Now, I'm just reminding myself we are indeed going to the alternate path here. Keep that in mind. I designed this rhyme to explain in due time. Then you go all... I know... The, I knew you had to do it, you know? Everybody's got a part. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah, either way. You know, in today's... Uh, in today's modern world, you know, it, it almost seems something... Everybody, if, if people have strong opinions on something, it's very rare for you to find... Like, who is a public figure that is both well-loved and well-liked? That's what I'm asking. You know, across... Uh, uh, political spectrums, across, you know, economic spectrums, across religious spectrums. Like, I was thinking of, like, The Rock, but even then, I'm like, I don't think The Rock is that loved. I think he is well-liked. You know, I think it's the same way, like, in general, most people are kind of, like, pretty okay on, uh, you know, like, Coke Zero or something like that. I don't know if there's anybody out there that's like Coke Zero. Oh, the nectar of the gods. But everybody's like, sure, yeah, you know, okay, I'll try it. Don't get me started on the new formula yet, okay? I don't wanna, because I've only had it two times. I don't have uh, that many opportunities to consume soda in my life. My mom doesn't want me to drink it. Uh, as a result, uh, I have to wait for her to go to bed, then I sneak some out of my dad's man cave fridge. This is all, I'm making this up as we go, in case it isn't abundantly clear, but... You know what's funny? I, so, again, I... Been reading a little bit, uh, over the course of 2021, particularly, particularly about stuff about, you know, behavioral economics, you know? Uh... Richard Thaler, Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, etc., etc. Um, it's, uh, the, I was always told, and, and I grew up just after New Coke came out. I was always told that, you know, the launch of New Coke is like a once in a generation uh, business failing from a company that you would expect to know better. For anybody that's not familiar, Coca-Cola, you know, they had a, a, a classic recipe. They changed it up in the late 1980s and released New Coke, which they claimed had a better recipe. Came out, people went, uh, what the heck is this? I hate this, it sucks. Um, Coca-Cola sales took a huge hit, leading to the release of Coca-Cola Classic, uh, which is, oh, excuse me. I don't know, we probably should have been a little bit uh, smarter about that, but that's okay. Um, leading to the release of Coca-Cola Classic and the conspiracy theory 
that Coca-Cola deliberately released an inferior product to increase demand for Coca-Cola Classic after they brought it back, which seems a little bit uh, sus to me that a company would deliberately uh, hurt its profits in order to in order to hope that it would increase demand for them later. But you know, if if they did it, well, you know, if I did it, kudos to you, I guess, for the uh, thinking outside of the box. Now, what I did not know, because that was the 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 myth that I had been sold by everybody who was, you know, alive and purchasing carbonated beverages back then. What I did not know was that, you know, the Coca-Cola Corporation, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, they're, uh, 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 you know, one of the largest food and beverage companies. It was genuinely one of the largest company companies on the earth, especially, you know, in the late 80s before the tech industry really took off to the same degree that it has, uh, you know, in, in 2020. You know, I'm willing to take you there. It's, you, you, you earned it. And let, let's go down. We're not missing the key piece. We get it next floor, right? That seems correct to me. Um, <clears throat> they did, like, extensive focus testing, taste testing, tweaking the recipe, double-blind studies, you know? what? Which of these beverages do you prefer the taste of? The new Coke formula or old Coke? And they found that there was a significant, I don't know, when they say significant, I don't know if it means like big number or just like, you know, uh, it, you can tell that the formula is actually causing the, the minute difference in enjoyment. Um, but they found a clear consumer preference for new Coke, which means, and yeah, I, I think you can probably see where I'm going with this one, which means my constant hypothesis <laughs> that I bring up in just about every episode where like if you hooked up someone's brain to an MRI machine I think you would find that they actually enjoy different things than they think they enjoy or they say they enjoy and I think they're lying not deliberately but because it, you know it's impossible for us to truly oh what's going on with my dang computer man it's impossible oh oh, oh, oh hello hello Bueller I think it's impossible for us, like in a in a in a very broad sense, to analyze how we feel about the taste of something, especially if it's wrapped up in a brand. But like when you taste an apple, are you actually like if I ask you how you feel about that apple, are you actually accessing the part of your brain that is eating the apple, measuring, you know, the magnitude of your enjoyment of that apple? Or are you thinking what do I tell people? What have I told people in the past when I when they ask about apples? That's where I'm at. And the, and look, I'm not saying this is not how the scientific method works. I don't get to just take uh, Coke's focus group testing and say that makes all of my hypotheses true. But it does lend a little bit of credence, if only anecdotally, outside of a formal context, that this phenomenon can happen. Right? These are pretty good items. So, the, I mean, if you're not following along, maybe I did a bad job of explaining it, but the moral of the story is, you know, people may, when they didn't know whether they were drinking new Coke or old Coke, they preferred the taste of the new Coke. However, what they preferred even more than the taste of the new Coke was believing that they were drinking old Coke. They're a Coke drinker. They identify as a Coca-Cola consumer. I don't want you to change the recipe of the thing that I already love. Even if it's better. I don't want better. I want what I got. It's an interesting thing to think about. How did this come up? Because I'm always talking about which is the best chip. <laughs> the first chip or the or the zero with chip, etc., etc. You know, it's... It, I mean, I think it's... It, I, people, they probably get annoyed that I, like, just harp on this idea over and over. They're like, we get it, we get it. But, I don't know, don't you, don't you find it interesting that you're... That to some extent, like, the way that you interface with your actual hopes and dreams and beliefs and the things that you hold to be true... Um, happens, like, through an, an intermediary in your brain? Like, you can't actually easily access what your favorite food is. You have to ask your brain, like, hey, could you please tell me what you think my favorite food is? And then you come up with an answer. Like, it's... I don't know. It's just... It's kind of interesting. Infested. 
Infested. Verp infested. Tears up. Dude, the, the pills are carrying this run right now. This is crazy. I don't know. I find it interesting. It's like... I, when people... like I, I, I try... Uh, some of my life and some of my conversation is an endeavor to get closer to the truth that exists within my brain instead of uh, answering questions by... Uh, fra framing it in such a way that people believe something about me that I want them to believe about me. For example, as a 16-year-old, you know, I, I took myself very seriously. People ask, hey, what's your favorite movie? Oh, I don't know. I'm a big fan of Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half. It's got great musings on, on mortality and uh, life as a middle-aged man. I didn't know anything about Eight and a Half, you know, except what I read on Pajiba. Now, I'm, I'm 32 years old. Uh, I, I, I can't kill all these enemies. It can't be done. Um, people ask, what's your favorite movie? Crank 2, High Voltage. The movie where Jason Statham has to... I, I, can't, I can't escape the room. The movie where Jason Statham has to constantly shock himself, otherwise his heart will stop. That's that's probably my favorite movie, I would say. Is it XL Floor? It is. And the, the reason I say, you know, when I was 16, I was concerned more with the perception. You know, I wanted to be seen as, uh, as a discerning customer. I, I wanted to be seen as intelligent. I wanted to be seen as someone with good taste, you know? So when, when you're a teenager, sometimes that's all you got, you know? Because all you talk about with your friends, for the most part, is movies and music and yada yada I didn't want to relate as much as I wanted to have better taste and I think it, it's taken me 20 years to admit that basically now I'm trying to get to the, I'm, I'm trying to interface directly with my brain's motherboard and be like which one produced the highest electrical response now I don't actually think my favorite movie uh, of all time is crank Too high voltage the irony here is now um, I want you to think that I am picking the movie that I like the most, so I pick a movie that is merely uh, a masterpiece instead of sublime, and as a result, maybe you're more likely to believe that I'm being honest as a result. You know, it's, it, it's a complicated web we weave with the human mind. Anyway, uh, dude, what it, the, it's incredible. Look at this, this item assortment. The only thing I would say, and, and I'm not trying to make it seem like this is a hard run right now, we are a little light on HP, and we're on a floor where we got to give up to HP. So there's there's an impetus for us to get some more HP up. Solo Lazarus is kind of an interesting... You piece? You know what? The bosses are kind of hard here. Solo Lazarus is kind of an interesting idea. Anyway, I just... It's something I think about, right? Until we invent the... Uh, the brain middleware that allows me, like you eat something and then like I can see on my iPhone that you like it at like a 6.4 out of 10 level and I'm like, oh, how is it? And they're like, oh, it's really good. I'd be like, you freaking liar. Such, you're such a Weasley liar, dude. Look, you could have just told me you didn't want to go to Pizza Hut. I understand. I understand. I'm the, I'm the freak on a leash who likes Pizza Hut. Doesn't mean you gotta go down with the ship or cast your hands up and surrender. There will be no white flag upon my door. What a what a shot. Are you seeing this? Owns. Um and we got a deal. Okay, so you gotta be very careful on the deal here, because we gotta give up some HP in order to get uh, continue with Oh, this is perfect. This is this is actually like ideal. You might think he talks so much about this. He's got no anecdotes. Well, I, I've got some anecdotes. Um, we, we've reached the age with our uh, our baby where she is... We're pursuing... Thinking about... Talking about the idea of sending her to uh, daycare. And it's been kind of a... I don't want to say a struggle, but it's been weird to conceptualize for me. Because I remember, you know, I went to like, you know, a bunch of daycares when I was a child. Um, just con so kind of like the bad boy of daycare, constantly getting thrown out. Oh, stop talking about uh, Big Night starring Stanley Tucci and Tony Shalhoub. 
No, I won't stop. To, I know I'm two years old. We're going to talk about Big Night, okay? 20 years from now, this movie's going to have a, a renaissance, and, and people are going to, you know, romanticize Stanley Tucci making the omelet at the end, and it's going to be like a whole thing. I know you can't see it yet, but I promise you, th this was me as a two-year-old. Anyway, but I don't remember most of the daycares that I went to, right? I remember, um, I don't remember the first daycare that I went to, because I uh, stopped going to it when I was like one and a half or something. Uh, and then I went to a daycare from like age two to five. And all I remember about that daycare is that one day I ended up getting like pulled out of the daycare because my mom's sister drove by and saw that the daycare provider had us all playing on the on the road. <laughs> Which seems like a great reason to take your kid out of a daycare, quite frankly. Um, should be supervising the kids when they play in general, uh, to, to the extent of your ability. They definitely should not be playing on the road, though. Hold on, we're moving on. I'm just try, Dude, I gotta give up so much HP here. And it has to... Oh, I haven't even done the other part yet. It, it has to be done, right? We, we might want to take the soul of Lazarus just to guarantee us some survival. Um, then I went to another daycare, and I remember two, th I remember three things about it, and I'm aging myself a little bit here. Th and by three things, I mean literally three snapshots. One is, they used to make shepherd's pie, and it disgusted me. It was just like a big Tupperware container full of, like, ground beef mashed potatoes and, like, chopped carrots or something like that. I just remember being like, I, or it, like, just nuggets of corn chilling in there. Just remember being like, I never want to eat that in my life. As I've gotten older, I've come to respect Shepherd's Pie a little bit more, but that was a, it was a bold first, uh, first experience. Um, I, the, uh, older kids at the daycare who were like, you know, 12, 13 years old, uh, they got to watch The Fugitive one day, which was a movie that was making a lot of hype. A lot of, dude, you, you... You might not believe me, but there was like a... It, the Fugitive A is a really, actually good movie. Um, but B was like an insanely... Like that movie had like Infinity War type hype around it when it came out. People were like, holy crap, this movie's good. Which maybe was not what everyone said about Infinity War. I'm just saying people... It got people talking, okay? It got people talking. That was a, a much smoother way to do that. Um, and then, and this story, I, I do chalk up to the childhood fallibility of memory. But I swear to God, I have a memory. Whether it's false or not, I have a memory of one of the daycare workers ordering and eating an entire Subway party sub, a three-foot-long party sub, in a single sitting at lunchtime once. And being like, that's insane. I was not impressed. I was disgusted, even as a child. Um, I mean, I guess, oh, give me one moment here. I was kind of hoping for something a little better than that. I mean, this is dangerous, man. Do we know what this pill is, at least? Shot speed up. Alrighty. Well, I mean, we hold the we hold this rune to be self-evident, which means if we get hit, it leaves uh, our possession anyway, in a good way. I'll take both of those, please. <laughs> Just yes. Um, I don't want to respawn though. No, no, no. Okay, hold on. This is we got plays. That was that was huge. That second secret room changes everything. We do it like that, do it like this. Okay, now now we're still going to take the rune with us. Just in case. We, we really disrespected 9-volt back there, but it's got to be done. Anyway, so I went to several, you know, daycares. But I don't remember uh, going to them as a baby because I was a baby. You know, my memories are not accessible or we're not forming or whatever. Um, so the idea of sending our... Whoops. <laughs> Our 13-month-old to daycare at first was a little bit unusual because I was like, what does a baby do at daycare? You can't really do, like, 
too much arts and crafts. You can't really, you know, you're, you're not going for like a, a jog or something like that or playing hide and seek. Um, but then, you know, we've been talking to daycare. What the heck? We've been talking to daycare providers and some of them are like, oh yeah, I look after like a seven month old right now. And I'm like, you have a seven month old in daycare? <laughs> First off, and, and I, I mean this with limited disrespect, my uh, condolences, because that seems like it would suck up a lot of time at the daycare. This can't be done. Okay, we did it. Like, a, a seven-month-old is a very high-maintenance period. I'm going, man. Ooh. Thank the Lord that we have, uh... That we have Kane, right? Like, without Kane, if we were running, like, any other character... The run shouldn't be that bad, but, like, the pills have really come through for us here. Uh... But it was also like, okay, I understand. Well, if you got, if you got a seven-month-old, then maybe, you know, having a uh, having a thirteen-month-old is not that insane for daycare. Maybe it's perfectly normal. And the more likely situation is that I just don't really know uh, what daycare <laughs> entails. Uh, so we we started to, to you know look into that. It's an in it's it's a weird thing, man. Some parents send their kids to daycare. Some don't. Um, a lot of people have said, like, if you work from home, why would you send your child to daycare? And, uh, I think that that's, I mean, some of those people are probably parents. I mean, I feel like the number one reason is, like, that you go to daycare is because you gotta go back to work. Um, wait, Chariot is really good here. Hold on, take this. That, that that's, like, just the way that society is structured. I understand it. Um... But there is also the uh, element for us that, like, I think if you if you only look at daycare as like a and and you know I'm open to opinions on this. Not that it's going to change our behavior necessarily, but if you only look at daycare as like changing uh, who takes care of the child by necessity because you have to go to an office, I think you're missing part of the potential benefit. You know. For, for us, I'm looking forward to possibly the idea that, uh, well, A, like both my wife and I having a little bit more time that is not exclusively soaked up by baby-based activities would be good both mentally and physically. Like maybe go back to the gym, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, one second, one second. Okay, I think we don't need any of these. I think we're okay. Uh, and the, the other thing is that I think it's good for a baby to learn how to interact with people. You know, she right now she interacts with her parents, and then her grandparents, and then the instructor at Activity Gym, and other kids at Activity Gym, but it's very coquettish, you know? It's like, you know, they crawl over to one another, maybe they pat each other on the head or something like that and then from that point onwards it's uh you know it's a crap shoot sometimes they pat each other on the head and then they go like hey, daddy anyway hold on just you believe in the me that believes in me how, how dare you there um so, so you know spend the i look I, I feel like most people's biggest problem in life, myself included, or biggest annoyance in life at least, is other people. <laughs> but I also do feel like it's uh, important, you know, to, to gain the skills of like realizing that not everybody is exactly like you. Learning how to both tolerate and, you know, interact and, and make friends and stuff like that with, with your peers. Even if they don't necessarily behave exactly the way that you do, or exactly the way that you'd like them to at any given moment. That's that's my thoughts on on that. So, we're we're pursuing it right now. It'll be it'll be interesting if it happens. Been, Kate's been watching a lot of videos on like, you know, trying to get your child to go to daycare, and I I didn't realize that it it, it makes sense. Don't get me wrong, but it's like a huge. Um, ordeal <laughs> to when and it makes a lot of sense right like when your your child has uh 
pretty much exclusively had its care provided by like the same two or three or four people over the course of its entire life and then you're like hey uh we're gonna drop you off at like a stranger's house see you and then like see you soon but it's not really that soon to a child is it but uh i think it's it's potentially an important step you know for that necessary uh that necessary step towards some degree of of independence however small Hmm, no thank you. It is funny, though, because I, I was talking to Kate and I was like, you know, you, I think it's important. I mean, I'm not trying to force her into it or anything, but, you know, it's important that, you know, we let the baby take some steps to um, not be on her own, but, like, at least start to embrace making connections with people that are not just us. Otherwise, you end up with that kid who goes to, oh, excuse me, a, tint, a tinted rock chain chomp? Um, what the heck? You end up with that kid who, like, you know, goes to college, but they have to go home every weekend because they're homesick, and then they don't make connections with their fellow students, and then it's time for the, you know, intergalactic kegger, and they, uh, you know, don't get invited on the potluck. They get stuck bringing cups or cutlery or something like that. You know how it goes. That old song and dance. And then I was, I was reframing it in my mind, because I was like, you know, to be honest... I, in, in my college experience, we did have some students who, uh, you know, they, they would leave the dorms every weekend to, like, take a four-hour bus trip to go back home and see their parents. I thought it was weird back then. Now that I'm, like, closer to being one of the parents than I am to being one of the children, I'm like, ah, it sounds kind of sick, actually. <laughs> it sounds kind of nice. But your, your perception changes as you get older, that's for sure. Or as you find yourself on the other side of the, of the coin there. This is why we, we open ourselves to being rude to our donation machine, you know? Uh, we, we be nice to it in the past, so we can be positive with it now. Now, there are problems with stopwatch, but the problems are not as myriad as the benefits. Now, I, I would... I mean, I hate to do this because our donation machine is like... I'm, I'm anchoring on it being worth like 920 coins. Oh, you piece. I'm, and I'm the piece there. Um, but I think we do do this. We needed 15 cents, right? And we buy the Eternal Heart. Though it pains me. Okay. And we could... I, I mean, Chariot is probably better served on the Ubermom fight. I think it, it's, it's not the best rune in the game, but it's like a great candidate for holding. This is a really good run. Like the, the the thing is, like we got great items. You need you need a lot of ingredients to make a delicious soup, right? That's partly true. You ever you ever go to the grocery store? You tell yourself you're gonna make like a beef stew. You end up buying more than you expect. It's not necessarily expensive. <laughs> I think we gotta try. It's not necessarily expensive. What? It doesn't even work? We, we just paid... False PhD doesn't override PhD? I'm gonna need to see a source on that. Then I almost just went down to the next floor. I, I, I mean, I apologize, but I assumed it would override PhD. Um, anyway. What was I talking about a second ago? I don't... Oh, yeah, whatever. I don't know. Isaac? Was I talking about Isaac? Was I talking about college? Was I talking about... Who knows? Anyway, that's what we're pursuing right now. It's a... It's an interesting time, you know? I, I've never really been in the, sho the shoes of interviewing someone. And interviewing daycare providers has been kind of interesting. You know, like, what kind of questions do you ask? I don't, I don't know what makes a good daycare provider. All I know is, like, you know, what I'm... What I feel like I would be most comfortable with. So I asked them questions like, like <laughs> yesterday we had an interview, Infested. and th this is not made up. I swear to you. I wish I could come up with the punchline this good. So we had read online that like one of the questions you should ask a daycare provider is like if you have an interpersonal conflict between kids, how do you handle that? So when she was like, "Hey, do you guys have any questions for me?" I said, "Yeah, let's say like 
uh, one of the kids, like, uh, pulled another kid's hair or something like that. Like, you know, kids are kids. It happens. Like, what would you do about that? I swear to you, she gave me the... the it's 100% true. She gave me the stink guy. Like, whoa, watch out for this guy. And then she said, well, you know, kids have to learn that from someone before they do it first. And I was like, lady, you're a daycare provider. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Come on. It's a, I, I'm not saying that's not true. But I am, that doesn't necessarily, like, I don't know how a kid would know how to pull hair without seeing it first. That doesn't mean at home there's a lot of, like, you know, slapping and hair pulling or something like that. You know, they go to the park, they see other kids that have learned it from other kids, which have learned it from TV, which have learned it from other kids. It's like, like don't cast, uh, don't cast an aspersion on me because I had the audacity to ask you a question about, uh, you know, how you would handle a conflict inside of the daycare. Like, I, I was, I was taken aback. I felt like she she almost hit me with a question, like she was going to start to flip the script on me. Which I respected as, as a negotiator. <laughs> then she answered it, and I was like, yeah, don't forget, we're, we're the client in this situation. I don't have a lot of power in other aspects of my life, but in this interview, you know, I, I, I control it to a slight extent. I'm like... Hey, there's three people and I'm third in line in terms of their uh, priority, but still, I got some pull. Anyway, I'll, I'll you know keep you posted on that because I'll keep you posted about everything because we're not exactly still living in an anecdote-rich part of... Uh, well, it's an anecdote-rich part of human history. It's not necessarily an anecdote-rich uh, part of my life in general, but we've gotten back to some degree. I think you gotta you gotta acknowledge we kept the lights on for just about 18 months of like only going outside to buy the ingredients to make fish tacos. Now we're like hopefully on the outside of, of that situation starting to look in once more. That was amazing. Wait, on the inside of that situation? I don't know. I don't know sides. That was pretty good, though. This will be interesting. I, I don't necessarily conceive of an easy victory against uh, Ubermom here, but I definitely think it's it's possible. The Chariot card lasts like 30 seconds. I honestly think you want to use that uh, on phase one of the fight and just position yourself in such a way uh, that your shots should still hit for phase two. Phase one of the Ubermom fight is harder, IMO. That's an IMO situation. You, your, your mileage may vary, but I think we've learned the, uh, the attack patterns there. <clears throat> I mean, it's also, it's, it's hard for the parents to drop the kids off at daycare too, you know? I can under, when I was a kid and like my, my mom filmed the first day I went to school, when she would show me the video later, I would be like, Mom, you know, I'm 12. I'm an adult now. Why are you, why are you reminding me of when I used to be a child? It's embarrassing. Now, I'm like, I totally get it, you know? I, I spent, like, every day at home for three years from when I was, like, a little a little bean baby to, like, you know... I would start to, like, make... I was old enough to construct sentences and, like... Too young for the sentences to be anything but like I I love you, mommy. Like that's that's a sad day, or at least a melancholic day. When you I, I bet you have an idea of like, oh my work here, you know, is done and it's not it, it's barely even started. <laughs> but you've like you you've maybe finished phase one. Um Yeah, I can understand that now, for sure. She did also film me uh getting on the bus for my last day of eighth grade. That, even to this day, I'm like, okay. I mean, this is, it's, I'm not begrudging her. It, it is a milestone, but I was kind of like, come on, mom, it's eighth grade. Like, high school graduation, sure. Um, middle school uh, graduation, you know, who cares? It, it, I mean, it was kind of a big deal because I went to, like, the same... I, had an I went to an elementary school, a kindergarten that became an elementary school that became a middle school. Um, so for 10 years, I was in like the same building 
so that I mean that's a milestone I suppose but I was like just that video of me getting on the bus I'm gonna be honest it's shot like crap like there's no cinematography it's entirely shot like through our houses uh, front window while I just stand there at the bus like looking at the sidewalk because you know we didn't even have cell phones back then and then the bus shows up and I get on like what it would Richard Linklater is like he's not gonna watch that okay but if and and the other thing this is not my parents fault but it's you know locked on a videotape now <laughs> And then I, I think they made the investment maybe like 15 years ago. They're like, okay, VHS tapes are going down. We're going to convert all these VHS tapes to DVDs, and then wouldn't you know it. Anybody else have a, a, a combination VHS DVD player? One. Of, this is true, by the way. One of the, the first times I ever found out you could record... Uh, your gameplay. Excuse me, how did I move there? Oh, you just tap it. Um, was, uh, oh, uh, and the chariot's done already, huh? I mean, we got good value out of it. I'm just surprised you're not dead, quite frankly. There we go. Um, one of my, one of my friends was playing Halo 2, and he was recording his gameplay through his VCR onto a VHS tape. To this day, I kind of still don't understand it. I mean, I guess if your Xbox was plugged in via your VH or your VCR in order to get to the TV, then the electronic signal passes through your VCR, which means it could be copied onto a videotape. Um, but that that was how things started, man. Like you might think that Fraps is like the most archaic piece of video recording technology, and don't even get me started, man, on on how far the industry has come in that sense, like. Being able to literally just record oh, you piece. everything in OBS and have it be good to go is insane. It, it filled a, a, a huge need and a, and a huge gap in the industry. Back in the day, you used to record uh, almost uncompressed video of video games via fraps. The file sizes were literally one gigabyte per minute. So if you had an hour-long video, it was 60 gigabytes. You couldn't just upload that because they had no means to capture your commentary. You would take that video file, dump it into a video editing software like Premiere or Sony Vegas. Uh, you would have recorded your audio separately. You're going to bring that into Sony Vegas, sync it up with like a 3 2 one. Videos back then were constantly like, anybody else notice the video audio is out of sync? Um... And then render it. And rendering, depending on your computer, could take one to two times as long as the runtime of the video. So, like, a 60-minute uh, XCOM video or something like that. It might, let's say it's a 60-minute record time. 15 minutes to get it all set up in Adobe Premiere. Um, render it out. That takes another hour and a half. So, you're, it's like three hours to make a 60-minute video. Now, it's just like, hey, we're done. I can put this on YouTube right now. It's a dream come true. Hey, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If you think it was a like button, it's a great deal. Of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. For now, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. See ya!